In this lecture, we will see how we can apply algorithmic information dynamics to integer sequences and behavioral sequences. And we will introduce you to what we call algorithmic cognition. So if we want to work with integer sequences, one obvious experiment is to see whether we can correctly characterize the hundreds of thousands of sequences in a very popular data database called the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences, populated by people and based on some recursive algorithms that generate the sequences. Many more experiments can be done and we have many open projects that you can undertake to apply algorithmic information dynamics to these sequences. But here we did um, a couple of in very interesting uh, um, experiments with very positive results. I have myself introduced a few entries in the database. I contributed with about seven sequences that were not uh, already in the database based on different uh, algorithmic processes. One of them is precisely the progression of number of Turing machines used for the CTM method, for example. With so many sequences in the database, uh, it is today somehow difficult to produce uh, new ones interesting enough to have uh, them introduced. Uh, but many number of these sequences m makes it to the database. Uh, and it is a great data set for testing purposes. So in the database is not only the sequence, but also the code in one or more computer languages. And the description uh, of those sequences. What we found was very interesting, that the textual description length as derived from the database or extracted from the database is, as illustrated um, on the left, best correlated with BDM than to any other measure such as Shannon entropy or lossless compression. And we also found that we uh, were able to show, as it is on the right, that BDM performed best when comparing the length of the program uh, also extracted from the database that generates each sequence and the BDM values of the integer sequences. Also better than the other two measures. And this is exactly what we were expecting because it means that our estimations of algorithmic complexity by way of algorithmic probability estimated by BDM are truly capturing something else that other measures cannot. And what they are capturing is exactly in the right direction because it is correlated with uh, the description length of the uh, algorithm generated in the sequence or the length, length in uh, b bits of the algorithm precisely uh, producing those sequences. So one great source to understand those uh, experiments is of, of course the original articles. Uh, but we can move now to other type of real world uh, sequences, uh, what are known as behavioral sequences, and in particular experiments that we conducted with sequences coming from different sources, sorted from cognitive simple to more cognitive sophisticated organisms. So first is a landmark experiment, even if sometimes controversial, conducted with so-called redwood or uh, antwood, uh, antblood ants, conducted by Russian researchers several decades ago, and then redone almost every decade again. Uh, the idea was to place food in the leaves of a binary tree that serves as a maze for forager ants uh, to find that food. Once they find the food, they come back to communicate the location of the food to other ants in the colony. All aspects of the experiment uh, were um, controlled, for example, to avoid pheromones traces in the way. And we won't spend uh, time explaining the details because you can go to the original sources, but you can go directly to both their uh, papers and also ours. So the hypo hypothesis to test was whether the forager ants would take longer to communicate information about the location of the food when the food was placed in uh, locations that require a more complicated number of turns in contrast to having placed the food in, for example, the leftmost branch in all cases. So at every bifurcation, the ant can choose left or right that can be encoded in binary by, for example, a letter such as L or R, standing for left and right. Then an easiest path to the food could be LLLL in this uh, example on the screen, which means take always the left branch and you will find the food. 
and that is a very short description. Um, in contrast, something like LRLL is slightly more complicated, but perhaps not much than LRLR. So if the hypothesis is right, then one could say that ants are somehow able to compress some of the instructions to transmit them to other ants because they find that there are some uh, simple ways to describe something that is uh, intrinsically uh, simple. So the researchers measured the times that ants would take to accomplish this uh, communication task and they noticed that indeed there was a correlation between string simplicity and communication time but they were unable to precisely quantify this. And it was not until we applied our methods that can deal with short sequences and are both, both sensitive and specific enough that the suspicion could be quantified. Here we can see that by using CTM, because BDM is here not necessary because the string length is less than 13, so we can use directly CTM only, the only measures uh, able to quantify and confirm the uh, original paper hypothesis uh, is both the approximations of algorithmic complexity and of logical depth using uh, CTM. This is another more recent experiment with perhaps one of the insects with most uh, simple behavior, a fruit fly. This experiment is much more sophisticated and to understand it in detail you must again read the original paper. But let me try to explain briefly how we were able to test CTM and BDM on this data set and experiment. So it has been long believed that flies are very simple, almost like robots, in that they only react uh, automatically to external stimuli without engaging in much co cognitive processes. So the experiment consisted in placing a fruit fly inside a cylinder. The fly is attached to a torque that detects the fly turning direction, with the fly actually not moving at all because it is connected to a brain signal detector uh, through diodes um, in its head. So the cylinder emulates um, three situations, one in which there are no patterns at all when the fly uh, turns, no matter what the, flies, uh, the fly does, uh, one in which there is a vertical stripe giving the fly some feedback about its turning behavior, and finally one in which the pattern is inside is uniform uh, with some texture. Um, so in the last two cases there is external information coming to the fly's brain but in the so-called open loop environment, there are no cues or external information given to the fly. So the experiment is designed to measure if the fly actually performs any strategy or, or engages in some cognitive process, even in the absence, absence of uh, any input. That would debunk the idea that flies have no internal experience and are just blind sensors to, that re react to external input. Without having to repeat the experiment, but applying BDM to the behavioral sequences that were extracted, ex extracted from that paper, that is the sequence of left-right turns of the fly intention to change direction that were recorded for the experiment, we were able to confirm that flies do not fly randomly in the absence of information, but implement a strategy of heading towards a single direction first, probably hoping to find some feature indicating their whereabouts but they also performed computational work according to our approximations of logical depth, because despite the, the simplicity of their movements, they were as sophisticated as those performed in the uniform case and also in the one-stripe experiments. Whereas in the original experiment, they had to actually see brain activity by connecting diodes in their brains, brains to determine how much cognitive activity they were performing in line with what we saw with our measures. In another experiment involving this time rats, an animal of um, apparent much greater intelligence than insects, such as flies or individual ants, rats were presented with a computer program that would challenge them uh, in their cognitive abilities to predict an outcome consisting in a signal that would be shown in one of two holes and if they, get it, they would get it right, they would be rewarded with a, a sugary wa water. It would sh show a sequence produced by an algorithm of increased sophistication and length. And there will be three of these uh, increasingly sophisticated algorithms uh, trying to uh, fool uh, rats. The first one was one very simple one, the simplest among the three. 
and it will be completely repetitive, showing the signal in a cycle of period two. So it would show in one hole um, and then the other and so on, completely predictable. And after some attempts, the rats would crack it and get one percent of the, one hundred percent of the rewards. So uh, clearly, the rats were uh, up to the task of uh, uh, outsmarting a very simple algorithm like this one. And the hypothesis to test was to see what strategy the rats would uh, take when outsmarted by a more sophisticated algorithm and whether they would still be engaged cognitively in some way, or they would just give up and behave randomly as a result of giving up. Here again, our results were also in line with the results from the original experiment, and they showed that uh, rats faced with algorithms that outsmart them, uh, make it, making them fail in predicting in which hole the signal uh, would appear, rats embraced pseudo-randomness, meaning that they were purposely trying to behave random as a strategy. This may mean that uh, trying to behave random as opposed to behave random uh, is actually some sort of a strategy. And uh, a strategy probably uh, taken by some sophisticated animals such as rats when they are outsmarted by competition or a pred predator. One can see in the figures how for the randomness um, in increases uh, how randomness increases from algorithm 1 to 3 even when they, um, when the standard variation is small for algorithm 3. But the median of the rat behavior is actually larger um, and in perfect, uh, perfect monotonic uh, progression. So we can see in our results how the sophistication of the algorithm uh, from 1 to 3 increases. But when outsmarted by algorithm 3, um, the logical depth of the animal behavior does not drop but remains as high as in as for algorithm 2 uh, that was already um, being a cognitive challenge for the rat as opposed to both the complexity of algorithm 1 and 2. Moreover, one can also see how the behavior matches the reward in algorithm 2 and 3 indicating that the rat was almost as su successful embracing a random strategy for algorithm 3 than when faced uh, with algorithm 2. We were also able to pinpoint the exact moments in time when different rats were able to crack uh, different uh, algorithms, with algorithm 3 labeled as competitor 3 in um, these uh, figures, remaining uh, mostly unbreakable as the behavior of the rat never comes down and remains as complex as the algorithm I itself, producing pseudo-random behavior. For the other two more simple algorithms, however, the rat eventually sees through and diverges uh, from the um, algorithm behavior. To make sense of these plots, take into consideration the scale of the y-axis. Finally, let's move to an example with humans. And this time it is us that performed the experiment from start to finish, uh, with the participation of about 3,500 people. And that has its rewards because the world media got very excited uh, of our results and made articles about them. The experiment consisted in five tasks, asking people to produce randomness in different ways. In the first task, they were asked to produce a sequence of heads and tails as if they were tossing a fair coin. Then they were asked to picture a random order of a pile of cards and guess which one was on top of the pile. They were also asked to produce a sequence as if they were throwing a dice. And finally, they were also asked to place dots at random and create a grid that would look random to them. The results were very interesting. We found that people at age 25 were able to produce the highest algorithmic randomness measured by CTM and BDM. And this was consistent across all five tasks and was independent of all sorts of variables that were controlled because people were asked uh, for their gender, education, background and level, language spoken and even paranormal beliefs, and no other variab variable but age produced a difference, meaning that, for example, there is no difference in randomness production between men and women. The results are in perfect alignment with many other studies 
suggesting that cognitive abilities peak at about age 25 before coming down. But do not freak out, the variation is minimal and barely noticeable. Here it looks large because that is the intention of the experiment and these plots, but it does not mean that uh, we will all become dumb or uh, were dumb when we were kids. There are also ways to keep the mind sharp and some traits uh, can be exchangeable by others because one may be able to compensate this ability with more knowledge accumulated over time. And actually, perhaps it is the accumulation of that knowledge that makes, makes, makes us uh, produce lower randomness um, uh, after 25. But notice um, how interesting was this experiment because it is in some way some sort of reversed Turing test where people, even if they didn't know it, were kind of uh, competing against computer programs to see which ones were able to produce better algorithmic randomness. So people without knowing were asked to behave as the longest computer programs producing the highest algorithmic complexity sequences. So if this were a game, people with 25 years of age would have better chances to uh, beat a random computer program at producing uh, greater, greater algorithmic randomness. So in this unit, we saw how we can apply algorithmic information dynamics to behavior and cognition of humans and animals, and many questions and challenges uh, remain open. And we have also written several other articles that may be of interest to you. And even some independent groups are now using our measures in all sorts of areas of uh, specialities, in particular psychometrics, to test cognitive abilities of the human mind. Here on the screen are some references and you can see how fruitful it has been. We call this line of research algorithmic cognition. In the next unit, we will see how CTM, BDM, and algorithmic dynamics can also contribute to discover some interesting facts about biological and artificial evolution.